Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Miguel Iterati back here on the Lights Out podcast. MMA detective Mike Davis off to the side here, but front and center as we are here for another deep dive. So we're a history podcast, but every once in a while we dabble with a guy who's still on the active roster on the big shows, the UFC and stuff. And that's the case today. And uh, we're back in the middleweight division, and we're back with a guy who we got a lot of ties to. Mike, who we got? So, Gerald Mearshart is, I'm going to do an article on this gentleman for Full Contact Fighter. I just started writing for them. And he might be the last of the old guard that has fought with headbutts. You know, I don't know about some of the Eastern European cats that are still involved with the UFC, but in terms of Americans, this might be the last guy. And and to think, and it's not just one or two fights with headbutts, he had almost 10 of them. So he's an old school guy. He's from Wisconsin. Um, I relied heavily on both, you know, first and foremost, if you give me information about somebody, I'm going to ask if I can drop your name. If not, I won't do it. But Hank Aguilar really helped me out with this. Uh, Nick's brother, who's training with Mark Lehman right now, and uh, really good friend, Brian Garrity. Both of those two individuals helped me with this interview and bring me through it. So um, we've got some really good stuff. It's I've got it all mapped out. I've kind of had my notes checked several times by other people. They appear to be in order. So we're going to kind of see how this thing rolls out. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Happy to do another deep dive. Fantastic. But we do best. And now that we got a 50 Fight Club member. It might not be looking up. It might not be all on there. But trust me. That shit's there. Don't worry about it. Um, Here's what I found. We got, oh, Jesus. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Gerald Mearshot. Now, how you doing, brother? Good to see you. Good to have you here. I'm doing great, Chris. How you doing? Man, uh, living the dream, man. So um, I always like to start off with it and uh, give a little bit of background or ask a little bit of background. We might know a little bit about you, but we want to make sure everybody does. Uh, where, what did you do growing up? What sports? What got you into fighting mixed martial arts? Uh, so didn't really get to do any sports growing up. Um, but I was, uh, in band and jazz band a lot. My only physical activity came from most of my life. I lived on a horse farm. So that's where I, you know, got a little rough around the edges and did a lot of like hard labor during that. And then once I, uh, originally I went to college for a year to become a music teacher and I found out I like fighting a lot more and I knew if I wanted to do that. <laughs> Now, if I wanted to do that, I got to do it while I'm young and my body can take it, right? So I was like, well, I'll put this on hold. I can always go back to school if I want to. And then, uh, yeah, so I started fighting. Man, I've, I've, we've never had somebody who uh, was a big music person and transitioned over. That's the first, I believe, is it not? We haven't had the heavy mic, Gail. Do you remember that? We were thinking about comprising, like, the world's toughest band, Sam LV, Drew Fickett. <laughs> you know, we're we're going to put you guys together. That's right. Figgett plays a fiddle or something, the violin, right? <laughs> yeah. The violin. Alvin plays the trumpet. I, I've seen him bang out on the piano too. Figgett's pretty, yeah. pretty talented. So, but Gerald, pretty good. so what instrument did you play? I mean, and did you get into fights in music class, dude? <laughs> <laughs> Toughest guy no. in the band, I promise. Yeah, no, I, uh, I played the saxophone. Were you in like the marching band? No, God, no. Oh, Damn. Come on, no, man. we we had like, cardio. Good. What do I know? No, we, yeah. No, we had a jazz band, so we played, like, all the cool songs. I didn't have to put on the monkey suit and do any of that other stuff. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. He, he, he made fun of those guys. Come on, we got to. Yeah. Sorry. That was good. That's embarrassing. So how did you actually walk into a gym and, and start your pet? Like, did you have a street fight? Did you have a street fight or, like, a, uh, an encounter when you were 12? Or you don't seem uh, like a street fighter, like, a, you know, an Eddie Alvarez type. <laughs> no, like I, I, I mean, I got into little like scuffles when I was younger, but I wouldn't call them fights, right? You know, it's like you're a kid, you know, wrestling around with your buddies and like kind of just throwing each other around, really. Like no punches were ever thrown, but I kind of stayed out of stayed out of that kind of trouble mostly because I just didn't, you know, really yeah. feel like pretty mild manner. I didn't really feel like fighting anybody if someone was like 
oh, you know, you're, you know, you're this or that. I'm like, okay, now what? Like, you're not going <laughs> to hit me. Okay. I'll just walk away. Like, I don't care if people talk. So, uh, yeah, no, I just found a gym. I knew I was on my own. Now I was living in the dorms and I was like, well, parents can't stop me from doing what I want now. So I'll go check it out. And I just walked in and I was like, Hey, I want to fight. And they were like, all right, idiot, jump in, go get started. <laughs> Pretty much after the first day, I just got right into training and I think I trained for like a month maybe before I had my first fight. Where were, where where were you at, at this point? Where, what, what college was it? I was at UW Parkside in Kenosha. Okay, okay, cool. Oh, okay. There's Kenosha. Right down the street so what, what gym did you walk, yeah, walk into? Was it Strasser's? Yeah, I walked into uh, Strasser's Freestyle Academy. It was on like 50-something, something like that. It's like a little, pretty much a little small building, one section of the building uh was rented out to like like baseball cards or something like that they sold some <laughs> some sports memorabilia mm -hmm. and the other one was uh was the gym and uh all it was was two different rooms back room uh the mats had like a platform underneath them so it was raised a little bit and then the front room had a matted area and like uh man it couldn't have been bigger than like a 15 by 15 boxing ring might have even been smaller than that and that you know as you know freestyle challenge in back in the day we always did in a ring kind of like pride we never did any cage fights so that was what we had to work with did you uh how did you find that gym in particular was it just because it was close or did you know anybody working out there uh well one was because it was close uh two this would have been 2007, so... It would have been 2006. 2006. Yeah, six or seven. It's gaining popularity, but it wasn't, like, huge yet. You know what I mean? So it still wasn't really common to see a lot of actual MMA gyms. So, And I had seen at Memorial Hall in Racine, where I grew up, that they had... Uh, they called them Freestyle Combat Challenge. And, you know, I saw... I think I even, you know... It, doesn't seem like it's that long ago because it's still the 2000s, but I think I found it in the yellow pages. Like I actually used a phone book, like an old person <laughs> to find the gym. So I walked in there. I was like, oh, freestyle combat challenge. I know what that, you know, I remember seeing that before. So that's how I uh, found the address. And that's a pretty, I mean, that's a pretty interesting time for that gym because it is Dave Strasser's gym. It's a small, you know, local gym really. But at that time you might've walked in and found, you know, UFC veterans, Nick Aguilar, uh, Ron Fairclough, even Rothwell might have been there. You know, there, there were – he put out some talent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. So I walked in there. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, and they did not hold much back on me either because I was – I was like a bigger kid. You know, you know, I was only 19 or whatever at the time, but – uh, I was like the same size or a little bit bigger than all those guys because they're all 45ers and 55ers. So you had Jamil Masu, who would fight in the WEC, uh, fought over in Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. Sergio Gomez fought in the WEC, had some really good tough fights and split Rob decisions. Roy. Thought, yeah, Rob Roy. Uh, Sharon Leggett is his legal name, but he was in uh, the WEC. They had fought in Bodog. He fought in UFC before. He fought in like one of the first WECs way back in the day. So it was a pretty good room. Brian Garrity was on Ultimate Fighter. Um, so they, it was a pretty good room. And actually, I think, oh, maybe it was like the one of the first couple months I was there, Ron and Pat came down too. And they were like a little bit bigger. And I got to go with them. And, uh, you know, I thought I'd be cute at the time. And I was like, I saw someone throw a flying knee before. And I kind of threw it. And even then, I was smart enough. I was like, I'm not going to try and hit him with it. But I'm going to like show the motion to see if I could even do it. And uh, that kind of pissed Ron off, so I got the shit kicked out of me after that. <laughs> but, <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing, so I kind of deserved it. So, uh, <laughs> January 13, 2007, Freestyle Combat Challenge 25 at the Racine Memorial Hall. Your first opponent is Fernando Gomez. What do you recall about your first fight? So that was uh, all the ones that I did were at Marina Shores in Kenosha. And those oh, were... It was, okay. Yeah, that was in like a, this little ballroom. And I remember uh, it was Sergio Gomez's brother. So, yes. and like, again, I'd only been training for a little bit and I wasn't like working with Sergio then that much. And he, uh, you know, he was just like, hey, just so you know, 
um, whatever happens, it's all good. Win or lose, like, you know, we can get a beer or whatever afterwards. Uh, I'm not going to hold anything against you. And, like, you know, I I just want to, like, he was just being nice. You know what I mean? Putting it out there like, hey, whatever it is, what it is, we're fighting. You know, we won't hold it against you. And, it, you know, looking back on him, like, yeah, probably because you knew your brother was going to kick the crap out of you. I wouldn't hold that, anything against anybody either. Because then I remember I was the first fight of the night. A bunch of my friends came. And afterwards, uh, I ended, I lost by, like, I think TKO or something. But pretty much what happened is he took me down, mounted me, and he would just, like, throw ground and pound. And I, you know, I didn't know much, but I knew enough to, like, kind of protect myself. So I didn't get too beat up, but I, like, I lost. The guy was just in mount. I had no idea how to get out. And I talked to my friends afterwards. They're like, yeah, uh, we saw your guy walk out before you. And we were like, man, I sure hope that's not the dude Gerald's fighting. And then we see you coming right out behind him. <laughs> I was like, yep, that was the first one. Uh, so you say that really was not your first fight? Uh, or, or was that your first fight? That was my first fight, yeah. Okay, I didn't know if that they had some that weren't on your record that were before that, but that was uh, – how long had you been training before you fought, took that? Oh, like a month maybe. <laughs> yeah, we've talked to a couple of people who had, uh, you know, train at Strasser's, and it's like, hey, I got a fight next week. You're fighting, you know, we're going to – we're just going to trial by fire. And if you're tough, you're going to last. You'll be around. And if not, you won't. You know, I bet there's probably a ton of guys who showed up and were there for two months and fought. I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> just never came back. Yeah, there was quite a few of those guys that had that. And then there was even some that, like, stuck it out halfway. And then when stuff wasn't going the way they thought it should, and they're like, oh, you know, it's been, you know, a year or two. And I'm not in the UFC. I'm going to go get a real job. So, I was like, hey, that's what happens. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, Nick Thompson fell into the category <laughs> that you fall into. Like you guys had a pretty rough beginning and it's amazing that neither of you two quit, especially based on your second fight, like your second fight, which I was there March 10, 2007. Uh, you fight Jay Ellis. Yeah. You want to walk us through it? Yeah. So I, I, they kind of undersold me. I'm like, this is the funny thing about Jay Ellis. If you look up Jay Ellis, his record is absolutely terrible. But he's he is 16, like a, right now he's 16 and 102. Yeah. Ooh. But I will tell you, like, legitimately, that guy is a world beater for like the first <laughs> minute and a half. When he tries, he's like, can he could beat anybody. And then he quits somewhere around the first minute and a half. <laughs> and he just like you know, the punch will come this way and he'll fly into it and just go down or like someone will barely touch him. And he just, he's just done. But, uh, so I saw a guy that I trained with at the gym, fight him before me and he took him down and just kind of like did a little bit of a small ground and pound and then ended up getting a choke. Well, like I said, never wrestled before, never did any of that stuff. So I was like, Oh, I know if I can, you know, I'll shoot a double leg because that's the only, like, words I knew around wrestling or anything. And I was like, if I'll shoot a double on him, I'll take him down, you know, I'll at least be able to hold him here. And then, you know, I kind of fear him because he, like, gives up. Because everybody told, me, everybody told me he gave up. No one told me he was, like, really good for the first minute. That was kind of important <laughs> information. Yeah. I literally – oh, so sorry about that. So, if I, I was standing straight up. Right. If this is my waist, I bent over at my waist and ran forward with my head sticking out in the middle of nowhere. And he perfect just wrapped up. Yeah. Perfect. You know, that's textbook. called a Brazilian double leg. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> that's like D1 championship level stuff. So I stick my neck out there and he wraps it up in a guillotine and it was standing. He didn't even jump guard. And I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just like, oh, I just got to keep pushing forward. And then all of a sudden I wake up and there's bright lights everywhere. And yeah, he just held on to my neck and I was like, oh, I'm not going to tap. And I didn't. <laughs> just went unconscious. How so, fast was that? Fast. So, I, well, I mean, I don't really remember was, the whole thing, so it was probably pretty quick. It's pretty quick. Here, here's the thing with Jay Ellis. Like we just said, he's 16 and 102. So you can sit here and just go, oh my God, he must be terrible. Okay. Experience. Well, here we go. He's got to win over Gerald Marchand. He's got a win over Nate Moore, UFC veteran. Ooh. Deep veteran Yusuke Kagiyama beat him as well. Bellator can title contender Daniel Strauss beat him. 
And he's got a rear naked choke victory over Brazilian black belt, uh, Rodrigo Almeida. Wow. Yes, dude. Yeah. So like Jay Ellis is like one of these like curious cases where people are like real quick to kind of point their fingers at him. Oh my God, look how bad or bad. You know what, man? He's like Reggie Strickland in boxing. The guy <laughs> can fight. And the seasoned veterans in the sport respect him. They, they, they really do. But it's like the kind of casuals at home tend to point fingers and make fun of them. But man, 100%, 100% that guy can legitimately fight. It's just getting past that first one minute. <laughs> now, now this must have been in the time before commissions, I would imagine, because if a guy's got like over 100 fights and you've got one, I'm not sanctioning that fight. <laughs> that doesn't seem yeah. right. Yeah, I think uh, Wisconsin didn't have a commission until 2010. Okay. So we were about still three, four years off before any of that. And I thought, so on all those fights too, my first, you know, 10, whatever fights for sure. Any of the fights in freestyle combat challenge, uh, not only did we have full pride rules, so you could stop soccer kick <laughs> the head of a downed opponent. We also allowed elbows because, you know, they didn't care. Like I think when I started, they had just stopped allowing headbutts. So literally you oh. can do any. You could do anything you wanted. As long as it wasn't a headbutt or a groin strike, you could you could punt people in the face while they're on all fours, whatever. The sky's the limit. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, Gerald, you're absolutely a throwback fighter in that aspect. You've kind of come from a generation. You caught the very tail end of a generation of guys that are – you might be one of the last that are still fighting that have fought under that rule set, to be honest with you. Like, that's, that's certainly something people should look up because – there, there can't be many left. No. And that, yeah, it's always fun when you, you get to tell the younger guys too, they're like, cause they, and now even the amateurs, they got so many weird rules, right? Where like, you can't like a lot of amateur places, you can't elbow if you're on the ground. Um, I think I fought somewhere before where like, you couldn't kick to the head for some reason. Ohio. Maybe it was like Ohio. Yeah. There you go. Amateurs couldn't kick to the head. And then the East sure coast can. is even crazier. East Coast, they change the round times. They shorten how many rounds you fight. They got they make you wear shin pads for like different levels, kind of, kind of like those uh, Muay Thai tournaments. And I'm like, the hell is this shit? <laughs> like yeah. I thought we were fighting. Yeah, well, I don't rules understand the not head kicking. Look about what they're making rules about. <laughs> I mean, if yeah. you say you can't do head kicks, I mean, how's that supposed to prepare you to be a pro? I don't understand it. It's it's crazy. Yeah, no, I don't. I like so the pancreation. That's the one thing for kids. Like, all right, you don't allow head strikes. They can throw a little bit on the feet, but you want them to focus on grappling. Completely understandable. But if you're yeah. like a 19, 20 year old kid, like, oh, I want to be a fighter. Okay, go into this fight. We're gonna put shin pads on you and all this protective gear, but you can't throw head kicks. Like, what are we doing? Like, you really do you actually want them to be a competent fighter, or do you want them to get to a big show and get their head taken off? But here's the problem. You get a lot of these commissions that none of the people have ever even thought about getting having a fight in their life. You know, I, sure. I like Nebraska, you know, Brian Dunn. He's a former, you know, 50 fight club member. He's the head of the commissioner. They're a great commission. Of course, he gets it. I mean, I don't understand all these commissions to be full of ex-fighters, in my opinion. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. So your first fight's in January. Your third fight's May 12, 2007, against Saint, Saint Shane Crutchen, the war rhino. I remember this guy. Ooh. Was somebody in the gym kind of taking you along and kind of showing you the ins and outs of fightings at this time? Uh, yeah, so I clearly had an abysmal start to my career, but uh, I just kept showing up. And, you know, some of the guys were like, well, if you're going to be here, like, we're going to get something out of it. So, uh, Jamil Masu was one of the first guys that really started helping me out. And that was pretty much really closely followed by Nick and Hank Aguilar. But, uh, yeah, from that time, you know, that's when I, I made sure I never missed a class and all that stuff. And I was, you know, one of those guys, I was there, I was there early. I was always mopping up after we were done. I was, you know, whatever I could do to help. And then just trying to sponge up as much information. And, you know, even though I was a lot newer, I was a bigger body. So I could still be an asset to those guys, even though they like fought at lighter weight classes, you know, at the very least, even if I'm kind of clumsy and doing the wrong stuff, I can just be big and try to like muscle through stuff to like give them some work. So 
um, you know, I owe a lot to those guys that are like really my first instructors and kind of helped me along. And that's where you can kind of see first two fights. I had no idea what I'm doing. And then that third one, then I kind of had started to have an understanding of what exactly I should be doing in a, well, at that time in a ring. Jamil's a good little fighter, and, and I imagine he's a better coach, too, just knowing him a little bit, personality-wise and stuff. Oh, yeah. Jamil's a – he was a good fighter. He was another guy where he had, uh, you know, he had some moments like when he fought Leonard Garcia in WEC. I don't think he ever realized it, but he had Leonard out cold in, like, a Darce, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he's fought some tough guys. He's fought over in Japan, but, you know, he's uh, – he still instructs. He's a black belt. Um, yeah, yeah, he yeah. teaches at Veneration in Kenosha, yeah. and he's also a high school teacher. So, like, it's perfect for him. We, yeah, we had Leonard Garcia. Wait, we, go, hold on. We, we, we had Leonard Mer- Garcia on, and he actually said that that Dars was in and he was out. He had no idea <laughs> how to let go of it. Yeah, he admitted Dude. it. None of us that I was watching, I was like, he stopped moving. Just keep holding on to it. Like, oh my God. I don't, yeah. I don't know what it was, but man, that was that, that I think that could have, that could have maybe changed the trajectory of that later part of his career a little bit. But, you know, yeah. Jimmy was a great guy. And he, if nothing else, he always fought his ass off. So I know he has no regrets. Yeah. There you go. No, I was just, I, I think I w- went with him his first time in Japan when he fought over there. I, rem- I was over there with him. And Strasser was with us. And I just have recollections of like a really respectful, really like good kid. Yeah. And 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 like the kind of guy like you can leave your kids with, kind of thing. Yeah, so for sure. You know, for I just sure. I I always respect him. And I'm friends with him on Facebook still to this day. So I, I really like Jimmy. I'm glad you mentioned him. So Shank Crutchen, you finally get your hand raised. How much of a relief was that? Ah, man, that was a big relief because, you know, nothing is impossible, but starting off 0-3, you'd be like, nah, maybe you should make sure you don't miss any of your college courses and get that <laughs> teaching degree. <laughs> go, go back three to in a row would be, yeah, yeah, it, it might have been time to go back to the band after that one. So that was, <laughs> uh, was kind of like, all right, I either got to figure this out now or, you know, I'm going to have to do something else. So uh, how, how I did mean, you win that fight? How did the fight go? Um, I, I just punched him a, a lot. Like literally I just walked forward and threw straight punches. Uh, I know he took me down at one point to kind of stop me. And I can't remember if the first round I reversed him and got on top somehow, or if it was the, or if it just got stopped and we got stood up. And then the second round, it was pretty like the whole five just walking forward, just tagging him with straight shots. And I think it was the second round he like tried to shoot a takedown and I got on top of him he either dropped him or got on top of him. And I was in the mountain. I just started punching until they pulled me off him. Are you trying to, is like, is Strasser trying to you right now? Or is it just kind of everybody? How's that? I mean, is he working with you a lot or just running classes? Who's, who's kind of in charge there? So uh, Dave at the time, he would, he would teach a little bit. Like he would show either show the basic pad stuff or like show some ground stuff once in a while. But he was, uh, he would kind of like the class structure we had is Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it would be an hour of pad work. And that was like our stand up stuff. And then an hour of just grappling. And then Tuesday, Thursday was our sparring days. And that was just kind of, we would drill a little bit and then we would spar and that would just kind of last how long it would last. Um, Mm -hmm. And he would, when I first came, he would show like we had a set, like, nine sequence or something combination on pads it's pretty basic stuff and then um and then half the time he would teach stuff on the ground and half time be other people but he was more of like a hands-off instructor in the sense that he would kind of watch everything go on and make sure it was running smooth and then like individually kind of like give you tips with different people he happened to be working with but my like on a one-on-one standpoint jameel at that time uh, and Mostly Jamil and a little bit of Nick were probably the ones that were mostly helping me out. Yeah. So, I mean, just for context, shortly after this fight, Shane moves to San Diego, joins 10th Planet, winds up in World Series of Fighting in Bellator. So, like, Jay Ellis is the second fight. His third fight's a guy that's got a really pretty high ceiling as well. So you're fighting tough guys. At any point, did Hank Agler 
or Nick Aguilar ever pull you aside, maybe tell you that fighting wasn't for you? <laughs> no. I found out from Hank, though, I think it was uh, my first or second fight. He was telling uh, probably a bunch of people, he was like, hey, someone needs to tell that kid that he, he shouldn't be fighting. Like, he should mm -hmm. really do something else. And wow. I, I saw him not too long ago at one of the local shows. He was like, that's the only time I've been wrong. <laughs> like, I'm glad I was wrong, but that's the only time I've been wrong about that. Yeah. Yeah, he's an eligible guy. I, I respect Hank a lot. Um, real good guy. Um, well, May 19th. walked into it not really, like, Strasser's not really, like, a technical – you know, gym like of that nature, but they're making you tough. You know what I mean? Because that's yeah. kind of like what they do. That's the you know Thompson, Nick Thompson described the process there is like they make you tough. But you 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 seem like uh like were you a, were you doing all right with that? Like you're losing fights. You you wanted to be a fighter from the very beginning. Like that's kind of like where I'm not. I, I just want to hear that part of your story too. Like, you wanted to be a fighter the day you walked in and, and, and told him you wanted to fight professionally in the UFC kind of thing? That was your dream? Well, I didn't say I wanted to be in the UFC out loud, but that was, like, my idea, but I knew I wanted to fight. And that was, like, you know, I, I knew I wanted to fight. I knew I wanted to be good at it. And in my head, I probably thought, oh, you know, every guy thinks they can fight. And then you get in the training room or you get in the ring, and then I'm like, oh, I actually have no freaking idea what's going on right now. I really need to fix that. Like, I just, me personally, I was like, I can't live my life not knowing how to do this. And I think I could get really good at this. So I'm like, you know, however long it takes. And I was at peace with the fact that, you know, anything, anything worthwhile that's going to happen, probably going to take a long time to happen. You know what I mean? And come yeah. to its full fruition. And I completely understood that and embraced that. And it's probably uh, what separated me from a lot of other guys that just kind of fizzled out is consistency and my tolerance for suffering, you know, both in training physically and just uh, the general mental anguish that comes with not achieving the goals you should achieve in a timely fashion. I mean, yeah. that's, to be honest with you, that's really a unique story. I appreciate that a great deal. Dude. Never really fought as a kid, walked into the gym, and now he's 50 fights in the UFC and stuff. That's a path very few people yeah. can take. Well, yeah. you know, on top of that, too, that's like awesome. you actually have the understanding. You, you've learned an instrument. That's not something that you takes place overnight. It takes a lot of practice and time and yeah. energy and thought. And for you to apply that same logic to fighting, I don't think a lot of people are – I think people are a lot more short-sighted than that. Yeah, no, a lot of guys are looking, you know, even listen to some of the language of, uh, you know, especially now the younger guys that come through contenders. First thing out of everybody's mouth, uh, I want to be, you know, everyone wants to be undefeated. There's nothing wrong with wanting that, but they want to be undefeated. They, they want to, you know, get highlight reel knockouts is both very normal, good goals to have. And then the, the next thing, you know, the next thing, if not before that is I want to fight somebody with a number next to their name. I want to fight for the title. You know what I'm saying? And like, it's good to say that and play the part, but I think a lot of these guys don't understand that sometimes people saying that is playing a part where it's like, yeah, I, you know, I would love to fight some ranked guys, but I've also had, like you said, like 50 damn fights already. Like I, I feel like I've earned that for one and two, um, you know, this is a very short time that we get to do this. You know what I mean? So once you crack that top 15, that top five, top 10, whatever it is, you don't really get any gimme fights after that. Anybody you fight that's not ranked, they think is the next big thing. Or you have to <laughs> fight somebody ranked. So that doesn't really increase your longevity unless you are ready to be in there. And a lot of guys think they're ready to be in that position until they get there and they're like, oh, shit, this is a whole other level of, like, experience and technique that I am not ready for yet. Wow. And you see that with, like uh... – not to call out a guy or mention him because I actually love him as a fighter, but like Cody Garbrandt, he was, it seemed like he was rushed 10 and 0, you know, not a lot of fights into the title fight. And then all of a sudden, you know, there are no easy fights at that point. And, you know, he, he took a dive and took, 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 you know, several losses in a row. And so I don't, I agree with you. I think putting in the work pays off. It really does. Yeah. Well, and even, uh, even another example would be like, look, I bet you could look up a percentage in like the maybe the last two most recent contender series uh, that they had going on. 
almost all those guys have like, you know, zero to two losses. And then, you know, they'll have like a guy that has a dominant win. And then, you know, look percentage wise, how many of those guys that actually won on contender series went on to do what they want them to do. And how many like had that good looking record won on contender series impressively and then got to the UFC and then just kind of shit the bed. Like it's, yeah. it yeah. seems to be more and more common. Oh, I think it's just logical that that's how mm. it went. Yeah. So your fourth fight is against Will Pace. Is he a training partner of yours at this time? Is he like the new guy at the gym that they threw in with you? Yeah, that was weird. That was, he, seemed like <laughs> nice, he seemed like a nice guy, but like, man, that was, uh, that was a different cat. I don't know what he did for like work or whatever, because it definitely wasn't his job. But like, all I remember was he was in there. <laughs> And he just kind of walked in like he wants to, but this is a difference, right? This is a grown, like I'm still, you know, uh, early twenties and this dude has a family, you know what I'm saying? Like he has a wife and kids and he's coming in there like, Oh yeah. Uh, I want to have a fight. I used to train karate with my stepdad or something. And, you know, we spent all the time. Yeah. Dude, he's literally said he would do karate with his stepdad. I'm like, okay, that's not outside the realm of possibility. Like there are some, you know, if you get the right person, like a guy that does, you know, the Kyukushin tournaments in like Japan and stuff, you know, very small Stephen sliver Thompson, of possibility. He trains with his dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's that's even a different thing. But I was like, all right, there's a remote possibility that you're not completely full of shit. I still think you're full of shit, but it's you know maybe you're telling the truth, and then he starts inevitably talking about like, oh yeah, I remember I threw a spin kick once and I broke his nose, and in my head I'm like, all right, now you're just. Now you're just inflating your own ego. And, you know, I was giving you the benefit of the doubt, but now looking at you, you got the bowl cut and frosted tips. It all makes sense. You're, you're full of it. <laughs> Everything you're saying is a lie. You look like you got rejected to be a backup dancer for NSYNC or something. Like, I just feel bad about this. <laughs> you're, so, you're that guy. Yeah. Exactly. You know, they, you, you hate to see it, but they inevitably, they all somehow find an MMA gym, don't they, Chris? You get these weirdos coming in off the street. And it, well, they just want to tell everybody, I'm a fighter. Yeah, this is my gym. Yeah. You know, they, they, they like everything except for the fighting part. You know what I mean? They love the lifestyle and what you, it brings, but they don't like the fight or the training, really. Yeah. No, so I, uh, yeah, I fought that guy. It, uh, it was some random like gymnasium in Racine. And, his family was there and luckily I didn't beat him up too bad, but literally I like, I came out, I picked him up, slammed him down, took his back threw a couple of punches to soften him up. And then I rear naked choked him in like, you know, a minute or two minutes or something like that. And then I, he came to train, was training at Strasser's for this fight. He wanted to roll with me beforehand. As soon as I rolled with him, I was like, Oh my God, this guy's terrible. Yeah. And, uh, he so you guys knew we were going to fight each other. And because sometimes Dave would match the card. Like at the venue, so you knew you two oh, were we fighting. Knew. Yeah, he he said he wanted to fight me. Like he, I I guess you could consider that a call out. And he was like, yeah. "Oh yeah, you want to roll?" He's like, "I know First we're fighting, but you want to." <laughs> yeah, one day he's like, I, "Yeah, I said I wanted to fight you." He's like, "You mind if we roll together?" And I was kind of like looking around, and you know, I was getting the vibe from everybody that this guy's a, a weirdo. And I was like, "I mean, I guess we could. You, know, you got to train, whatever, man." And then I rolled with him in my head. I was like, "Oh, geez." This is awful. And then I never, after the fight, he trained like three or four times, never saw him after the fight again. Were, were, were you ever thinking like when you were rolling with this guy's just faking how bad he is, so I'll get over half of it? <laughs> That's probably what I would have been thinking. There, there was like a split second I was in my head. I was like, is it possible that someone, because I wasn't good when I started, but I wouldn't suck this much. Like there's, <laughs> there's something wrong with this. <laughs> yes, right. So Joshua Herford is your fight after that. But there's very little information that I could find on it. Like, there's no venue. Like, the name is ISCF, which is, or IS, you know, that's, that's not the name of the actual event. What can you let us know about this, this fight? So, that fight, I didn't know this. We drove into the middle of nowhere in Illinois. I don't even know how they got this fight set up because it was technically an amateur fight. And I didn't know that. And I showed up to the venue because keep in mind, I only fought on freestyle combat challenge. So like we never had, this is another thing. We never had weigh-ins. They literally just be like, yeah, you're fighting that guy. No one had a weigh-in. Nobody knew what anybody weighed. You kind of just told Dave and he was like, oh yeah, you guys are the same size. Like literally I went to the one of the freestyle combat challenges after that, where we had weigh-ins and I walked up and Dave, 
had some dude that he was with there at this thing. And in my head, I'm like, oh, this is Wayne's. I got to show up to this. I show up. This He's like, he's like, pick him up. This dude picks me up. And he's like, what do you think? He's like, oh, yeah, he's 170. And they're like, all right, you're fighting this guy at 170. Like right, the Brad Kohler method of Wayne. Yeah. 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 I was like, oh, oh, OK. But so I show up to this place and uh, I forget the name of it. And I feel like I have the DVD somewhere still. But well, was it in, was it in Canton, Illinois? It could, yeah, I don't. It was somewhere. Was it in Bob Long and Phil John show. Bob Long was there. I don't know if it was his show though. It's that would make a lot of sense because Bob came to a lot of the freestyle combat challenges and knew Dave pretty well. So that would it wouldn't surprise me. But I remember it was in one of those big inflatable domes, and we get there Ooh. and they're like, "Oh yeah, this is an amateur fight." And that was one time they're like, "Yeah, you can't kick him in that." Or yeah, there was some we couldn't. Oh no, elbows. They're like, "Yeah, you can't throw elbows." And I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, is that? <laughs> yeah. And they said, this is an amateur fight, the commissioner. And well, I don't know if it was a commissioner or whatever the acting authority was. And I was like, I'm a pro. I can throw elbows. And they're like, you can't for this fight. And I was like, that doesn't make sense, but okay. So they, I told them to their face. I am, a, I have a pro record. I fight with all my weapons. And then they were like, doesn't matter. Step on the scale. I don't even remember what it said. They were like close enough. Uh, I think I ended up having to like wrap my own hands. And like, I had those really flimsy Everlast gloves back in the day that probably weighed like a half an ounce. And uh, yeah, I went out there and I walked pretty much walked straight at him and just threw straight punches with my chin sticking up in the air. Luckily he wasn't about that life. So I just punched him in the face until we backed up against the cage. Uh, I think he shot on me. And then, like, I forget what I did, but somehow I got to his back, and then I ended up rear naked choking him, and that was a pretty short fight too. Are you like cornering people this like at this time? Are you going to other fights? Are you like kind of uh, being really all involved with the team and everything? At that point, I wasn't cornering anyone. Uh, I was more being like a you know like a partner because I didn't have nearly enough knowledge of anything okay. to like. And the, you know, to that end, a lot of the guys that knew what they were doing, they had already like kind of moved on to other shows at that point. I think like Nick was probably still fighting in Bodog then. And Nick Thompson or Aguilar? Aguilar. Both. He okay. either, he was still at the, he was either just after or at the end of his little Bodog thing he had going. <clears throat> um, and then he even had a, a Bellator fight, uh, but that was a little while later. But uh, yeah, I didn't start really helping out coaching in corner until, Till I had been doing it for a, a few years, and then I okay. really got involved. Would you like go to the fights just to support your team? Or was it kind of weird, like a team environment type thing, or were they too far yeah. away? Yeah. So especially if we had a freestyle combat challenge. Chances are I was fighting, and if I wasn't, then I was in the back room. You know, I was holding pads, okay. uh, getting something for somebody. I was there doing something. You know what I mean? Okay. When you fought Daisuke Hanazawa. Um, on August 11, 2007, you guys were probably training partners as well. Am I correct? So we, I don't know how they worked it out, but they got there. I think they got there like in time to have the fight, but like I never had trained with them before that. We trained after a lot. Okay. And that was a, that was an interesting one. So uh, it was Daisuke, uh, Yusuke Kagiyama and Kichi Kunimoto, who changed his name to Kichi Strasser, or like his nickname was Kichi Strasser, and he eventually fought in the UFC and Bellator. But I had the pick between Kichi and Daisuke. And again, still don't know much. I'm like, oh, Kichi at the time is two and one. Daisuke was like, he had like almost a 500 record. He was either like 13 and 10 or 13 and 15. It was somewhere around there. And I was like, oh, you know, this guy doesn't, like, really have any stand-up. Scrapping looks okay, but the other guy's two and one, and there's no film on him. I was like, well, I'll take the, you know, this guy, Dice Gay's shorter, and he's got more fights, but, like, you know, maybe the other two and one guy's really good. Well, turns well, out he, wait, wait, hold up. He, he, he's, he's like a 500 record through the Japanese system, which, which is, is legit. brutal. <laughs> it's so like brutal. Yeah, it's yeah, not even yeah. fair. Yeah, no, like, he had fought Eddie Alvarez and stuff. So, and again, that's <laughs> my point. I didn't know my head from a hole in the ground. So I was like, oh, yeah, that number looks better. Let's go with this guy. And his stand-up wasn't good at all, but didn't matter. His grappling was really, really good. Like Nick rolled with him after the fight, 
And he looked at me, he was like, yeah, there's no way you're going to win that one. I was like, thanks. Thanks for the most <laughs> But one thing I did do is I said, because uh, everyone was like, oh, he's going to try and take you down as his grappler. I was like, they're like, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I want to stay on the outside and hit him a lot. But I guarantee one thing, if he shoots on me, I'm going to knee him right in the face. And that happened. I need, I need him dead in his eye. But it didn't knock him out. So, like, I, he ate the knee, took me down, and then he eventually, uh, I think he got Kimura. He got a yeah, Kimura. Yeah, I was a key locker Kimura. So, didn't work out to my favor. And then I see Kichi fight after that against my buddy Tim Agger. And they're like going back and forth. And I'm watching it in my head. I'm like, well, that guy could have, like, I definitely would have been fine with that guy. Like, what the heck was I doing? <laughs> Yeah, experience means a lot, especially like Mike saying that, you know, those Japanese systems, none of those guys had good records. All they did was fight. And Japan's Murder. different. They, nothing but the tough, this tough, other tough the whole time. And it's not about wins or losses. It's about longevity and being tough. And, man, you, you fight a guy there with 50 fights, that guy's a beast no matter what. Yeah. 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 How does that, I, I did that. I, I made the Eddie Alvarez fight. I think that's where he met Strasser and those guys in – and kind of hooked up with that Milwaukee connection where a bunch of them moved up there. But And before that, I stuck him in with Clemente. So he didn't have an easy road with me. And no, he went the distance no. with Clemente. So, you know, definitely you know, a I think confident dude. To, to kind of properly set the table. So in essence, Steve Strasser's gyms in Kenosha Racing, Wisconsin. He hooks up with a guy named Shu Harata, who's a friend of the show, from managed a lot of guys from Japan. And they had... Dave had like, <clears throat> like four Japanese guys that spoke no English, <clears throat> excuse me, living at his house, trying to communicate and talk. And um, I mean, it, it's, it sounds like I, I know they made a lot of really close relationships with you guys without oh, yeah. even having the ability to communicate with you guys. Yeah. Hand to hand combat turns out as a universal language. So we all got along great. But it's funny, like uh, you guys know Shu. So all those years ago, and uh, Yusuke actually ended up coming back. Uh, he came back once. And I, oh, man, I took him, oh, what the hell was it, Indiana or something? So some, like, weird place. And I ended up, uh, that didn't turn out too well for him. He fought somebody that was, like, really tough at the time. We had, like, taken him to the hospital afterwards. That was, like, scary. But he, had, he, hey, he came back by himself before. And then all these years later, so Shu brought all those guys. Just like a couple months ago, this kid, Ren Hiromoto, who fought for K1, Shu got him to come over. Well, he wanted to, but he came over to Duke Rufus's. So, and Ren was a, a kickboxer that's getting into MMA now. And uh, he is going to, lost his first MMA fight, came over here to train more for MMA. But he knows Kichi as well. So, like, not only did both gyms that I've been at so far, Shu has brought guys to. But like they trained together, that was really wild. That's cool. <clears throat> so you take five months off, which is unusual for you, and you fight a Midwest legend in Kenneth Allen. Yeah, who was one in twenty-five at the time. I think he's like one in forty-eight now, or two in forty-eight, or something like that. How does First that fight all, get lined up? Hold on. First of all, why the long layoff? Were you just training or no? no I mean, school, what was going on? Were you still in school at this point? Uh, I mean, pretty much after I uh, started training, I was technically enrolled, but I didn't really show up to many classes because I was at the gym all the time. So, Oh, your uh, parents must have been pissed. I This is the thing. I told them, they're like, you got to go live in dorms and like whatever. And I told them, I was like, that's a really bad idea because I'm probably not going to go to class. Like, I, I said that very casually to their face, and they're like, no, you got to go live somewhere else. And I was like, I'm telling you, if you send me to the dorms, it's probably not going to turn out the way you want it to. And sure enough, <laughs> luckily, I was doing something else, but it didn't. And, I, and they were like, oh, you just weren't going to class? I was like, no, I literally, like, I'm 19. You think I'm magically going to get all this independence and discipline because I live somewhere else where I have no reinforcement of authority. Like, no, that's not how this works. So yeah, I, I was probably enrolled at that point, but I can't remember. I don't know if it was, if we didn't have any shows going on or if I was taking time to train or what it was, to be honest with you. So Kenneth Allen, one in 25, you uh, get through that unscathed with a triangle choke. 
you know, they, you, you, yeah. get that, you get through one of them. Um, and then you roll up against a guy from Adrian Serrano's combat sports gym, um, Khalib Kroll, who's legit pretty tough yeah. at that time. Yeah, that was uh, that was a war. That one was yeah. interesting because I, I think I won a split decision. And I remember I had him in a couple spots where I thought I'd be able to put him away. Like I had him in a deep triangle at one point. Uh, we were both swinging on the feet. There's a great still shot that I think is on my Facebook where I'm like, we're both swinging at each other. And I sort of like my chin is up in the air like this while I'm swinging. And that must have been right before. I know he dropped me in like the last part of the last round, but I still kept up kicking, up kicking and fighting back. And uh, truth be told, I like I, it must have flash knocked me because like I remember, I remember standing up and like getting my hand raised, but they were like, "Oh, he dropped you at the end there," and I was like, "No, he didn't." And they were like, "Dude, yeah," and I saw it, and I was like, "Oh shit, he did!" <laughs> I was like, "Not that that I kept moving," but that was uh. And that was the first time I actually ever got any kind of payment from Dave too, because it was such a good fight. Because I didn't, you know, my all my friends were broke college kids, so I didn't really big bring a big crowd. So like at the time, it was like, oh yeah, you train, uh, you get to train for free, and then you just fight, and that'll be your your dues. And but that one, he was like, that was such a good fight. He gave me a little extra change, so that was fun. Nice. That's so you weren't a big the ticket seller. Were kind of kind bringing you along with some of the earlier guys. And then they slipped behind Azawa. So they were kind of, this is an education process. There's a method to, to Strasser's madness, I think. Yeah, it was a little bit different. But yeah, no, I wasn't a big ticket seller. I didn't, because no. remember, everybody else would sell a lot of tickets because they'd be out at the bars and stuff. I didn't do that. I literally just trained and didn't do much else because, well, A, I was broke, so I wasn't getting in any bars drinking anyway. And B, I just never, never really enjoyed that. You, you know, I, um, Mm -hmm. I kind of thought you were because your next opponent is Alex Carter. You win by triangle choke, which, you know, Alex, I'm thinking are kind of bringing you along with some of the easier fights because they're kind of seeing something at the box office. And, you know, Ryan Sheeper as well, you know, falls into that category. And those are your next two opponents. So Chris Lytle, Ryan Sheeper, he's got a, from Iowa, total record is four and 38. Would you like to guess who one of his opponents may have been in the past from Iowa? Ryan oh. Schieffer, huh? Travis Fulton. <laughs> Travis Fulton. Yeah, that's, that's a good guess. guess. <laughs> and, and, you know, Chris, if I would have said, well, he's weighed in at 155 pounds before, your response would probably be, oh, he's probably fought him three or four times then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you got, you got those two. You got Ryan Schieffer, Alex Carter. And uh, you roll in a Madtown Throwdown, Pat O'Malley's event um, against Mike Vaughn. Yep. You know, so you're, you're getting like the fights you need at this point. And, um, you know, you, you kind of end this winning streak with a loss against Curtis Bailey. What was that like? Uh, that sucked because I was like terribly, terribly sick that day. Like literally worst case scenario, I wake up puking at like three in the morning, the day of the fight, like barfing my brains out. And this was the thing that did me and my glands were all swollen up in my throat. Like I was getting chills and then I was sweating. Like I just had a bad flu and we're driving up. Uh, and you know, uh, Nick Aguilar's driving me up and he's fought before, but he's like, Oh, you know, you'll be all right. As soon as you start warming up on pads, you'll be good. Like that old school mentality. And honestly, I probably would have been okay, but I went to like take this dude down because I'm like, I don't got, I know I don't have the energy for like a war right now. And this dude's all, well, it was kind of lanky. So I was like, I'm going to take him down. And he had, he wasn't even in the right spot. Like I think I was in half guard or even maybe even landed in side control on the right <laughs> side, but he like just kind of wrapped his arms around my neck. And because my glands were so swollen, it was choking me. Like, he barely applied any pressure, and as soon as I shot, it was, like, one of the things that you take a guy down and they're, like, trying to grab on your neck just to make you uncomfortable, but there's not really a submission. Well, in this case, there was a submission because it just happened to be that my throat was almost closed up as it was. So, yeah, it was kind of a – that was kind of a rough one, and that dude got super, super happy about that, and I was, like, wasn't going to make excuses, but it's like, ah, you motherfucker. <laughs> Rematch yeah. time. 
Yeah, there's a couple couple guys on your record where you know, we talk about it on the show often with with certain fighters where you know anytime you're fighting, you know that guy's probably buying the pay per view, inviting his friends over to go. Oh, I got to win over him. And, you know, just, I can't believe he's on TV right now. You know, yeah. I had no idea. That could have been me. I decided yeah. not to keep going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you take several months off, but in between then, you're actually showing up in corners of people. You actually cornered Jamil Masu when he fought Rafael Asuncio at the WEC. Do you recall cornering him? I didn't corner him in the WEC. I thought I saw you and Brian Garrity in the background, and Garrity slapped you. Nope. I thought that was you. It had to have been you. I thought it's when Bob Long. Okay, here, let me set this up. Jamil Masu and Rafael Asuncio, I thought that was a WEC. They fought at the UIC Pavilion. And when they're announcing Jamil's name, Garrity's arguing with somebody and Garrity slaps the person. Kind of like as a no. joke. No, at I the never. End of... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no. I never, I never cornered Jamil in any <clears throat> WEC fights. I cornered him for a Madtown throwdown before, I think. And maybe some other show, but I don't think I've ever because of the times that I cornered Jamil, it was like I think it was like just me. Like we okay. just happened to be at the same place. But yeah, I never I never went to like a, a more major event like that until uh, uh until I cornered Nick for his Bellator fight against Mosfidal. That would have been like the first one. So just a little caveat to that story. When Bob Long, who's the referee at the time raises uh, Asuncio's hand because it's a split decision win, Dave Strasser pulls his pants down <laughs> on TV. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a Dave thing, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, when you were talking about having, like, four Japanese guys there who can't speak English, that sounds like a Dave Strasser thing, too, just <laughs> living there. Like, how awkward would that have been the whole time? <laughs> you, you show up at his house like, yeah. Joe, have, about you, right. have you been to Strasser's basement where he has the karaoke machine and and that nightmare? No. Have, have you experienced that? Him no, and Pat I have Do karaoke down there because he Dave has a Filipino wife and like it's a he spent like three thousand dollars on a system <laughs> to do this. <laughs> so. I believe it. I know when he had those Japanese dudes living at his house. He probably messed with everyone that walked into his home. And was like, oh yeah, they all speak perfect English. Yeah, <laughs> crazy yeah. stuff. Go ahead, Mike. I'm, so yeah, you hit a little patch. Like <laughs> future UFC veteran Kenny Robertson in your next fight on a Madtown throwdown. Not an easy bout. No, and that was one of the that was one of the real ones where it was like I I just hit another spot where that guy was just better. Like at that point in time, you know, maybe if we had a kickboxing match, I'd have a better chance, but you know, just with his wrestling pedigree and his grappling and stuff like that, and he hit funny that uh movie hit me with it was like he was kind of taking my back but hit like the like the sodula stretch is basically what it is um the same thing that uh Aljamain sterling and then zabit hit on guys but this was before anybody had seen that but he would you know he did it from like wrestling and i just happened to not have very flexible hamstrings so i was like i was just stuck and then i saw he later Later, I saw he actually he wrestled uh, Ben Askren, who eventually would be one of my coaches and training partners. Did it to him in a match, uh, but luckily Ben has like freakishly flexible legs and you know just weird flexibility all around. But yeah, that was one of those ones where I was like, I once I felt what he was doing, I was like, yeah, I just don't. I'm gonna try to win, but I just don't have an answer. You know, the <laughs> the only way I would have won would have been like just bite down and swing, but I never got the chance. Yeah. Yeah, Robertson, uh, no joke, at a Central Illinois Combat Club, you know, city with a few thousand people, and they've had, you know, Jerry Noble, Johnson, and stuff make the UFC, so a pretty, pretty talented group of guys in their own right. So you got two losses in a row. I'm assuming that's right around the time that you uh, decide it's time for you to leave Dave Strasser's check. Uh, I don't I don't think that had anything to do with it. It was more that, uh, so Nick Aguilar was starting a gym in Racine and, you know, for the longest time. So like there was like Jamil always helped me out a lot. He probably start helping me more on the front end. And then as he got more, you know, closer to getting his teaching degree and was in school and stuff, Nick was there a lot. Nick would work with, a lot with me one-on-one. -on -one, and I was, I was learning a lot from him. Like, you know, we'd, 
always did tough man training basically. So that wasn't a problem, but I was really getting the knowledge from Nick. So when he was like, I'm going to start a gym, you know, for a little bit there, I was training uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at Nick's because I would still get like the knowledge and the information. And he would all like, he was the one always running classes and uh, Tuesday, Thursday, I'd come back to Strasser's to spar because, you know, Nick's was just a new gym. There wasn't anybody there that fought but me and him. And then after a while, we built up a decent little team with some amateur guys that, uh, you know, they had some pretty good records and they were, they were tough, you know, just, it's kind of like uh, Strasser's 2.0 in that sense is we had, you know, a lot of tough, hard training days. And uh, then at that point too, also everybody from Strasser's kind of slowly started, you know, stop fighting. So Sergio Gomez hadn't been there for a while. Garrity was kind of hanging it up. Uh, there's another really tough guy, Warren Kikaba that trained there that he was done, had been done for a little bit then. So at that point I was like, okay, Nick's got a gym. There's no more training partners at Strasser's. I'll make the full move over to uh, ACS is what it was called. Yeah. I think the problem was a lot of the new guys that would come to the gym, which are the roots of the tree would kind of get clipped a little too short and they, they he, he wasn't kind of getting the new guys. He had the real top heavy hitters, but guys like you were far and few between that would stick with it because the training sessions were so brutal. Huh. Yeah. Well, a lot of, I saw more than a couple guys come and go, but that's the thing too, right? Is I, I think once Dave saw that his, like the guys that he really worked with, like his main group of guys were starting to like retire and go do something else. I think he just, you know, seemed like he lost the passion for him, just wasn't in that much and whatever it happened to be, he wasn't there. So I was like, well, I still want to keep doing this. So I'm going to go with the guy that's still teaching. Yeah. So you got Jacob Cooster is your next bout, a guy from Rufus sport. who was actually pretty tough. Yeah. So, yeah. What was that like having your opponent cornered by your current coach? Uh, I actually, I never really thought about it until you just mentioned it, to be honest with you. I think (laughs) I'm not even sure if Duke cornered him. I think it might have been Red Schaefer and somebody else at the time. But, uh, but yeah, no, it was, uh, he was, like you said, he was tough, especially for that Wisconsin scene. Um, you know, he, he came out, I was like, you know, you always want to do the thing that like, isn't your specialty or like be good at the thing that people think you won't. So like before every one of my fights and now I know myself a little bit better. I'm like, well, I want to knock him out, but we're probably going to exchange on the feet. We'll get to the ground somehow and I'll end up submitting him, which is almost always what happens. Right. <laughs> so at the time, I'm, yeah. So at the time I'm like, Oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to come out and I'm throw the biggest one too. And that's when I did. And then the dude shot on me. I'm like, Oh, come on. Really? Like you train at Rufus sport. You're supposed to be kickboxers. What the heck? So he took me down. He got on top of me and took my back. So I went to all fours, try to get up. And then I kind of shook him off. And as soon as I got on top of him, I started hammering on him. And then I saw his neck get exposed and I choked him and put him out. And that was a, that was a pretty good win for me. Cause that was, I think, you know, I was at ACS full time at that point, And that was like, you know, local shows were a bit bigger of a deal back then. And that was like my, I think it was the first like local show belt that I won. Was that on Duke show? Yeah. Yeah. At the, at the time it was called uh gladiator. Yeah. Yeah. Oh huh. yeah. That's wild. Um, after that, Nick Aguilar starts, throws his head into the ring, decides to do racing fight night. And with himself as the promoter, Man, that is not an easy hat to wear, especially if you're so used to being on the fight side. Um, how was your fight against Morris and Lamb? Oh, it was quick. Yeah. So, and to that point, Nick only did, I think we only did like three shows or four shows, yeah, maybe. It's not easy. No. And, uh, but yeah, so I, I fought Morris and Lamb. Uh, pretty much all that happened is I threw a head kick that, like, shaved the top of his head and i man if that would have landed he would have been out cold but he was a shorter guy so i kicked right over the top of him and then he kind of ran in at me and took a shot and i got a hold of his neck and that was it so i you know just under over a minute this dude had like the worst tattoos i remember he had like a <laughs> yeah. he went by like ghost face killer he was all wu-tang dial man <laughs> yeah he was uh he's a character yeah, Just yeah. Look, looking through stuff here while you're talking, Nick Aguilar, I, I must have made 15 of his fights, you know, throughout his career and stuff. 
And I just want to mention it, Mike, you'll like this. He, uh, he has a win over Cade Swallows. Cade's out there, and he's a fan of this podcast. I know he'll be listening. So just a little shout-out. Sorry about okay. that. <laughs> um, Eddie Lara, when you fought Eddie Lara on Extreme Cage Fighting, was that Adam Sandoval as the promoter, or was it somebody else? Uh, that was somebody else. And at the time, uh, at the time, Eddie actually had a decent record. Like, I think when I fought him, he was – seven and four or something like that he was tough they, yeah 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 so that was when he was like trying and then you can see in his career he stopped trying but then you know it was hard for me to get fights so it ended up that i got matched up with him a couple more times because he would just agree to get a paycheck <laughs> now at the at that point were you training and living at the <clears throat> at the combat training center uh i was only there for like a year maybe a little yeah. over a year. So I was, uh, yeah, I was up in green Bay. The first time I fought Eddie, I was still down in uh, Racine. The okay. only, I don't think I had any MMA fights when I was in green Bay. I had, I did a kickboxing fight against whisper Goodman who I had had a loss to, and I beat him up for three rounds. So that was kind of fun, but, uh, yeah, I didn't have, Oh, it's so the second time I fought Larea. That was just after I had left green Bay and I was training at uh, Rufus sport at that point. Okay, because I knew there was you, you took a teaching job at a place for a while. Yeah, so they, I was like coaching there, and they, you know, they said it was going to be something, and it turned out to not exactly be what they had in mind, and then like it changed ownership and stuff. So the guy that owns now it's called Title Town MMA. It's owned by Eric Chang, who's a really good friend of mine. He's a great dude. Uh, before it was just different people, and they were kind of getting led along thinking that they could make it something that wasn't like their eyes were a little bit bigger than their stomach. So like it, you know, I but they had like barracks, really, right. What's that? Didn't they have like a, like a housing facility for you guys? They had a place that uh, like the owners owned it and I got to stay there, but there wasn't like a barracks or anything. They, they had a lot of interesting ideas, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it was a waste of time. It was good because I got to like, you know, give my body a break for like a year or so and like uh, really get my hunger for fighting and everything else. And like, you know, until you can't do it. And that's exactly what happened. And I was like, no, I still want to do this. I was just, you know, waiting to get back into training and do all that stuff. But it did, you know, kind of let me learn how, how I teach and how I would run a gym, which eventually I plan on doing pretty soon here. So it was a, it was a good experience in that sense. Now, you were living with Ron Faircloth at that time, too. Am I correct? Uh, for a little bit, yeah. How, how was that experience? That was nuts. Ron, Ron's a trip normally, but at this point, he was uh, very heavily medicating himself. He and, admitted that. Yeah, he, that's something. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, and, like, it all came to a head because one day I came home and he tried to stab me because – he uh i was like staying in this room and it didn't have a door and uh so and there was like a bottle of alcohol in there that magically disappeared but there was a bunch of people in the house so i was going around asking everybody and somehow it got to him that he, someone told him that i thought that he did it and i never i had never said that i was just trying to figure out what happened because like there wasn't a door on my room so i was just going to be like hey if you did this like you know it doesn't really matter. Just don't be going in my room by my stuff, you know, unannounced. Like this is my, my area or whatever, like just respect, respect the space. Uh, but he heard something from somebody else first and didn't want to listen. And I'm sure he was, you know, all hopped up on a couple different things and yeah, got home and he was really, really angry and had a knife and was kind of trying to get me to a corner. And I just got out of his way and he got angry and like stab was with broken knife off and then like i kind of talked him down and calmed him down and then uh after that i had like told the owners too and i was like hey i don't you know i don't want anything bad to happen to the guy but this dude needs help so like they got the police involved and luckily he didn't like go to jail or anything but they were like put him put him under some kind of watch because i was like yeah this isn't him or his personality this is a result of a lot of different chemicals mixing together inside of him but so, you know ron admitted I mean, publicly admitted, I might add, like on, on video, that uh, he got hooked on Oxycontins and um, after a surgery, and 
you know, it was just way too expensive for him to buy. And he was, he was using heroin towards, uh, you know, the end. And, you know, as, as you, you had mentioned, Brian is pretty trippy to begin with. Um, yeah. inc- incredible human being. Um, when I had my experiences with them, but I know when people kind of go down a dark path like that, they're, they're not the same person. And it's unfortunate. Right. No, and I had known Ron for years. Like we had, you know, he was one of the first guys I had got to train with. So I had, you know, uh, I had nothing good but good things to say about them. That was just an unfortunate incident that just kind of, you know, hit him at a bad point in his life. But he needed help. You know, and he he admitted that. Like you can look yeah. up Ron Faircloth on YouTube. You'll see a video of him admitting, not mentioning your name, but just saying, hey, man, yeah, I was in a bad place. I was doing things I should have done. I went after a guy because I thought he accused me of doing something, which he didn't, but I thought he did of something yeah, that fine. I actually did do. He's like, <laughs> I mean, you can say what you want about Ron. He always took his weight. He always took his own weight, man. When he's, I don't know. I, I miss the guy. Yeah, no, I, it's unfortunate, you know, how the later part of his life went like that. And I actually saw someone sent me that like years and years ago, but I ended up seeing that video and stuff and, you know, even after all that stuff had happened, his, uh, whoever was working with him and reached out to me and like, you know, I had said something on his behalf and they were like deciding what to do. I was like, Hey, I don't think the guy is like, is a mean person or like a bad person. I think he just needs help. So, and it looked at, you know, for a little bit there, it looked like it was working. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, for sure. For sure. So we mentioned Adam Sandoval's name. You roll in a combat USA against Jim Klimek, or Kliz, was it Klimzik? I'm never going to get that name. I think it's Klimchek, I think. Okay. (laughs) So with Combat USA, from what I remember, they had a real small, like, pay window in the beginning fights because they ran it like a tournament, but the finals had, like, a $10,000 payday. Am I off on that? No, was an interesting one uh the first fight if you lost you got nothing through the whole tournament Uh. yeah that was a heartbreaker (laughs) so the first fight you would win 500 bucks which not bad for a local show second fight you won 1500 and the third fight you'd win 10 grand and you'd win uh a diamond championship ring that was uh, supposedly worth around 10 grand. And then they also, and then this all happened, by the way, they, they did all that. And I actually took the ring somewhere and they looked at it. They're like, yeah, the metal it's in isn't nothing, but the diamonds were real. So like, yeah, it could be worth about that much. And then they took us on a 10 day trip out to uh, Vegas to train at the tap out center is what it was at the time. So, and that, that first one, I wasn't involved in the second one they did, but the first one, yeah, they, a lot of guys didn't do it because they were kind of like, there's no way that they're actually going to do all this stuff. And they did it. Wow. That's, that's huge local promotion. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. And I think it's probably, you know, 99.9% because they had a casino packing. So that doesn't hurt. Yeah. Uh, so you fight Jim, you first round KO, and then you roll into fighting Ron Faircloth. Was this a part of that tournament? I know I, I, I think I saw it was yeah. on Madtown Throwdown, but was it a part of the tournament? It was part of the tournament, yeah. So was it on a Combat USA or a Madtown Throwdown? Uh, it was a Combat USA fight, but they probably worked it out like Ron and Pat. I'm sure they had some say in it because we were at the Alliant Energy Center. So it was like a hometown fight for him. So they probably did like, you know, a co-production, so to speak. Like, we'll still do the Combat USA. You do your whole production, but we're going to, you know, we'll set up the venue and save you some money here, but maybe we'll get X amount of ticket sales or something like that. Okay. So at the time, Ron is 33 and 17 in a UFC vet. And, you know, you're walking in to, like you, you said, his hometown, former training partner. Were there any concerns on your end at this point? No. Uh, I admit that was, like, one of the best times, like, best I've felt for a fight. Uh, you know, not because of who I was fighting like that. I was like, man, that kind of sucks that I got to fight Ron, especially because I knew, you know, Nick was so cool with them and stuff. And Nick was in my corner and I know he felt like kind of weird uh, cornering against him. But uh, just like my preparation, 
Um, I was fighting at 70, fighting at 85 and not having to cut a ton of weight. Like I just felt really, really on for that fight. And I, I did, I performed really, really well. Yeah. So you went with a rear naked choke in the second round. Um, what were the conversations like with Pat O'Malley and all of them afterward? Oh, they were, they were really cool about it. No one had any, uh, animosity after that. Um, you know, I've seen Pat a few times since then i've always been really cool with pat uh you know no problems as far as that fight goes with ron afterwards like even right after the fight he i think he was just more surprised at how well i did because you know he remembered me being the little kid that woke or walked into strassers and that he could just kind of throw around and now all of a sudden you know he's on the other end of it that's kind of a big transition in those few couple of years like passing of the torch when you yeah. were living, when you were living with uh, Faircloth, I heard a rumor that a fighter was on top of a car and the car got driven into the side of the house. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't Ron. That was a that was a whole other incident. And that I was I wasn't living in that house at that time. I was gone by then, but I I am aware of what allegedly had happened. Yes. All right. So every time we mention James Warfield incidents, his wife or girlfriend yells at us through our YouTube comments. So we're not going to mention that it was him or her that's yelling at us that was driving the car. Um, so Sam Elvey, a future UFC veteran, uh, September 10, 2010. That's your combat USA finals. He's 11 and one. You're 13 and four. And there's a $10,000 prize on the line. Ooh. Yeah, Marcus that was that. a man. That was a big fight, and especially because we we had trained together before, like we were cool with each other. And I almost kind of felt bad, right? Because when I saw him at the trials, uh, he was like, "Oh, I thought because I told him I'm doing 185, and he was, and I thought he was going to do 205, but he was coming down from 205 to do 85. And he was like, "Oh, I thought you'd do 70, and like we could all win, you know, together." And I was like, no, man, it's a tournament. Like, I'm not going to cut weight, like, back-to-back -back months like that. So, you know, neither of us had thought we would fight each other, but everyone was super excited locally about that because it was like, he was really good, good record. I had a good record. You know, better guy at 170 coming up, better guy at 205 coming down. Uh, we had trained together before, and, like, he was always, like, scrappy on the feet and like a little bit lankier, but I could take him down and get a hold of him. And then it kind of like, we had closed the gaps on each other. So in that fight, I was doing a little bit, you know, better on the feet than I would have before, but he was making it my life difficult as far as like defending the takedowns a lot better than he used to. And uh, that I finished that fight in the final minute of the fifth round. And after that, I was like, I am not ever doing that shit again. I'm going to get it down and finish it way before five rounds. F that noise. Like that was, but it was, you know, that a little bit of everything. We fought on the feet. Uh, I took him down a couple of times and ground upon him. He stuffed a couple shots. You know, he got his licks in. I got mine in. And when it came down to that final minute, you know, I had to say a little prayer in there. I was like, just let me get this dude down one more time and I'll take care of the rest. Like, just give, give me strength to get one more takedown. And I got in on a single and I got him down. I was like, all right, it's all or nothing. And I got a hold of that neck and I got the guillotine for the finish. Yeah. Nice. So Paul Metz was the trainer for uh, Sam Alvey at the time. I think there was a little bit of controversy around, you know, that, that time period between yourself and the gym, his gym, I should say. About me. And oh, dude, you were on a combat USA, like talking smack about it. He's like, a oh man, I forgot about that. Yeah, no. So they, yeah, I was just talking reckless shit about him, like being a karate instructor and teaching anti bullying classes and all that. <laughs> like, I got nothing. He had said something to me, like, hey, man, I'm like, you know, we're cool. I'm just, I'm just out here trying to sell the fight, man. I'm just talking shit. Like, isn't it what you're supposed to do? Like, this is the first time that people had ever really interviewed me. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, let me, let me build it up again. And, uh, but he, yeah, I think he was kind of butthurt by that. And, uh, he said something to my coaches too. And like, it was funny because Nick calls me up laughing. He's like, this dude said, I've never felt so disrespected in my life. <laughs> I was like, man, 
I talk worse shit than that to like people I'm cool with. Like, if you think that was bad, you should come to one of our training sessions here. How we talk to each other. And like, those are my brothers, man. But so yeah, he didn't take it as kindly to that as I thought he would. But like, <laughs> I, if I remember right, I had talked to him after that and I'd seen him after I was like, Hey, like it wasn't anything personal. They were just like, and this is the thing, uh, you know, young and dumb. And literally for the interview on, I had on like sunglasses and I think like a fake chain or something. So like, yeah. Clearly, I was playing Don't a character. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. And LB, shortly after that, left for Team Quest and you know, made it to the UFC. Um, you know, trumpet player, I believe, another band guy that, that somehow <laughs> made it to the big show. Um, it's funny, like, when I, when I talk about yourself, a lot, like, for people of Wisconsin, I mean, with the research that we put into this interview, a lot of people said that, if they had to pick two people that absolutely they never would have guessed would have been fighters, both you and Sam Elvey would have been put <laughs> yeah. into that category. Yeah, we'd be pretty high on that list, especially, uh, you know, especially at that time, like, physically, I've changed a lot since I've gotten into the UFC. And, you know, you looked at me then, I was kind of skin and bone or wasn't much. You wouldn't look at me and be like, that guy fights. <laughs> yeah. So were the, ears this, not, were the ears not messed up yet? No, well, eventually they got messed up, but then I was just kind of a beanpole with goofy looking ears. So like that could have been anything. That could have been a birth defect or whatever. <laughs> All right. It came out that way. <laughs> yeah. Don't look at them. <laughs> um, uh, Wisconsin state champion and was, I think he, he was a scholarship to Iowa for wrestling. Dallas O'Malley, Pat's son. Um, you meet up with him at the Combat USA, I think it's season two. And um, I was a little shocked at that. I, I didn't think that they were going to send Dallas at you. Yeah, I don't know. That was, uh, you know, it was a tough fight. Dallas is a lot bigger than I was. Well, I'm sure he still is a lot bigger than I am. But uh, that one surprised me because he... I'm expecting him to shoot. I'm like, oh, great. We'll grapple. Like, that's fine. Like, I had rolled with Dallas before. I knew I could submit him. And then he was, like, playing the range game and moving away from me. I'm like, what the heck, man? So, he, like, he did good at that part. And it was kind of funny because I hear Pat yelling, he's a one-trick pony. He's a one-trick pony. And then the second round, round, Dallas shoots in. And I hit the guillotine again, like, my one trick. And in my head, I'm like, man, the dude just would have <laughs> listened to your dad and stayed on the outside. He might have had a better chance. But, yeah, he – uh he was getting the better end of me on that first round, just kind of like using his range and it was really throwing me off. But, uh, you know, he shot in and I found the neck in that second round. And that was, uh, and I think too, probably the weight cut didn't help him. Cause that was a big kid. You know what I mean, he was, there wasn't much left on him to cut. I, I was shocked. I thought that he had some legs on him too. You know, cause he was pretty young at that time. I thought yeah. for sure at some point you would have went to the big show, whether it was Bellator or the UFC, but I don't think he fought after that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what if he just didn't have the same passion for it, or if, you know, he just got burned out to go go yeah. in a different he, direction, maybe. But yeah, I think uh, I was just kind of surprised to see him at eighty five because that kid is huge. I, I think you yeah. mentally crushed him, and his life has changed in the worst, off of the worst. Yeah, he quit. Dude, he, he quit college. <laughs> he was on scholarship, I think, under Gable, and uh, he left there. Like it's, I think he just cases somebody getting burned out. Yeah, that could be it too, because that you know. Especially if Pat was pushing him in that direction, that's a yeah, that's an unrelenting thing to have happen to you. Because like I got to do this after my childhood was over, and like I wish I would have you know wrestled and done all these other sports. But on the same hand, I had you know uh, like no mileage to speak of getting into it yeah. as opposed to someone like that who you've probably been wrestling his whole life, and you know that's just a lot of that's a lot of competition in that time. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, it's a lot of miles. It puts a lot of miles on you. Absolutely. So your fight with Whisper Goodman, which is in the Combat USA Finals, you're trying to go back to back and make some cash. A little strange outcome on that. Yeah, I just made a stupid mistake. It's like I got in, I forget if I took him down once or not, but then he ended up, somehow I, I'm, I forget if he took me down or what happened, but I go to get up and I went to hit like this little trip, but I kind of left my neck. I'd stayed a little too more, too bent over instead of squatting to hit this trip. Uh, and he just wrapped his arms around my neck. I just left it sitting there. So that was just like a tactical error on my part. And like, 
if it was someone else, you know, maybe I could have fought the hands and got out of it. But, you know, this is a strong dude. Like, that's one of his attributes. He wrapped his arms up and it was locked in already. And there was, you know, not much I could do about it. Yeah, we're talking about a former Green Bay Packer in Whisper Goodman as Ooh. well. So you're looking at just like a grade A athlete to begin with. And he's probably got a really good clinch. You know, it's a lot of core strength. Um, yeah. Sean Tompkins was on commentary mm -hmm. for that fight. It was really interesting to, to kind of go back and watch. Oh. Well, I had no and idea they had him in this fight. Uh, l let me ask you, you won the finals against Alvy. That's 10 grand. So here you kind of didn't get the same paycheck. How did that affect you? Because, you know, I, probably you thought you were going to win going in the same, you know, get the same money. And now you're having to, you know, take show money kind of kind of talk, you know, and 10 grand is not a bad paycheck. You can live a few months over that. So how how, how was that aspect of it coming up here? Uh, that didn't really affect me too much because you got to remember, I fought for a long time and didn't get paid anything. And then when I did start getting paid, I made like, you know, 500, 600 bucks. So I was like, it was nice to get 10 grand, but I never would expect that that was going to be a regular thing at this point until I got to a bigger show. So like the fact that it didn't happen, I was, you know, stashing money away anyway to kind of just like survive and keep training. What uh? What, did you did you work during this time? Were you working at the gym? What was your? How were you getting by? I worked at this big sports complex. I'd open it up at five in the morning, work for a few hours, then I go up, just up to the gym. When the next person came on, I get to train. I could come back and work a little bit more if I wanted to. Train again at night, and then, you know, pretty much just be home. And that was more or less what I did. Where were your parents at at this point? Like, were they, do they have concerns about you? Because at this point, you're pretty, you're a pretty big deal in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> I don't know if they would have known that, but they, I mean, they saw me keep it from them? No, they, they saw that I was at the tournament and they knew about my fighting and stuff. But, you know, especially back then, if you're not really into it, I don't know, you know, if they're thinking like, I wish he would get a job or something. If they were, they kept it to themselves really well, but. They also know me well enough to be like, well, if he wants to do it, he's going to do it whether we back him or not. So he might as well just let him do his thing. Have they been to any of your UFC fights? Uh, they haven't been to any UFC fights yet. They were at some of my earlier fights, uh, the local ones, obviously, and they've been to uh, – yeah, the, I'd had a UFC fight in Milwaukee. I don't think they came to that one, though. I, I can't remember – to be honest with you, but uh, I, yeah, I don't think they've been to any UFC fights th so far. So that'd be cool to get them out to one one of these days. You know, it is. It's just it's just so different. I mean, you're talking about people that lived on a farm, living off the land, and like your life and the path you took to kind of get where you're at right now is just so bizarre as compared to every <laughs> single other person in their social circle. Yeah, a lot, a uh, lot more bright, shiny lights. The places I go to now for fights than what I'm, I'm used to. And even now, like I, you know, I'm not as much out in the sticks as I used to be, but I'm definitely more out in the sticks than I am in the city. So it's always quite the uh, culture shock being in Vegas. Yeah, and you know what the thing is? There's nothing wrong with either side. Like, no, both not at all. Lives are perfectly fine and great to have. Much needed, you know, with, with, with in the world today. It's just, it's different. Like it's your path is so like, if you would have said this at six years old, what you wanted to do, they'd been like, yeah, kids a little crazy. You know, there's no way. <laughs> like, there's, there's no, yeah. There's no even like fiscal possibility of that ever being a thing. <laughs> no. But you know, at the same, you know, kudos to, to mom and pop too, you know, because you have uh, avoided a lot of pitfalls. Man. You know, like, you know Ron is an example of, stuff like that. And then when you get bigger and stuff like that, there's, there's a lot that comes to it. And you really are one of those guys that was grounded really from the very beginning. So, you know, that it's still paying off for you, I think, you know, so kudos that to structure. Mom and Dad a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And that, that definitely is one big thing. I've always tried to keep myself grounded and that's, you know, whether it's something like that with substances or guys like, you know, not handling their money right or just kind of fizzling out in their career because they don't have the – they don't have a long game in mind. Uh, I've seen a lot of woulda, coulda, shoulda guys that, like, had all the talent in the world or, like, you know, they either just didn't tra training seriously enough or they couldn't put the mental pieces in place or whatever it was. And I was like, man, that's 
you know, it's just not easy. And very few people have everything kind of line up where they're, you know, they can turn it on in competition. They're mentally tough enough. They have the physical gifts and they have a good place to train. So, you know, you got to make up for some of those things one way or another. And I just, you know, been fortunate enough and stubborn enough that I figured it out for myself. So, so Miguel, he's worn a couple different hats or he's experienced a couple different hats in regards to matchmaking, including in the UFC. You started under Joe Silva. Am I correct? Uh, I can't remember if Joe Silva was still there, but I know, I think when I right started, there. he was, he was there, but I, my matchmaker has always been Mick Maynard as far as I know. Okay. okay. That's not, I mean, those are relationships that you've got to be very delicate with. I mean, the, the last thing you want is to make an enemy of the matchmaker. <laughs> Yeah, well, and so, like, I've only had very limited interactions with Mick. I shared an Uber with him once to an airport after one of Woodley's fights. So, you know, didn't talk a whole lot, but, like, uh, he seems like a nice guy. Uh, I've always had, like, a manager I'm with uh, Sucker Punch with Brian Butler right now. So he, you know, I let him handle all that. And it, it, I'm not cool enough that I see all those guys that much. I'm sure eventually I'll, like, get to know all the UFC brass that are higher up better. but. Um, well, you you've know. got over a dozen matches there. Well, yeah, but I've never, I've never like fought for a title or any of that stuff. So like, I, you know, they, they kind of take care of all that when they, when you start getting cooler, they'll get a hold of you and like, let you know, and like call you up and talk about stuff like that. So it just hasn't happened yet for me, but I'm sure when it does, we'll be fine. But it's like, I, I've had very little involvement with the matchmaking other than just saying yes to fights I get offered. Huh. Speaking of, of, of yes to fights, and I, I, I got like two more fights in the local scene. Um, the one thing that kind of, and this is my opinion, that kind of hurt me as a fan, you know, of just of the sport as altogether, is just kind of how that Cosmat Chimaya fight was, you know, not only like you were, you took the fight, but then he also had a fight lined up right after, regardless of what took place in the bout itself. It was just kind of it was kind kind of hard for me to see a UFC veteran, somebody that's put the time and sweat in, kind of be put in a situation like that. It wasn't easy for me. Yeah, well, I mean, shit happens. You know what I mean? You either tough it out or quit. Yeah, but how did <laughs> they present that to you? Because that that may be like when he blew up, or it was right around there and stuff like that, like to become a big name and stuff. Did they present it to you like uh, you know? Let's put a stop to this guy's run, or did they sell him? Like, how how was that interaction, or was that something that you really didn't feel, you know, you just took it, it from your magic? It, it was kind of presented to me, to me in, like, two different ways. Like, it was a little bit like, hey, look, if you want to get a fight, like, you're going to have to take this fight. And then, on another hand, there was, you know, somebody that didn't care for him all too much and wanted me to, like, put a stop to it is what I had heard. You know, again, I didn't hear this from the actual people. But uh, it's interesting the way it all played out, though, in the sense that I had, I was supposed to fight Ed Herman before this. And, like, the day of the fight, I found out I tested positive for COVID. And then they said that, you know, and then I, I think it was not long after that, they offered me the Hamza fight. And then after he knocked me out, he didn't fight for a long time because of COVID. So everybody kind of ignores this thing where, you know, yeah, I looked like absolute shit, you know, and did not do my job 100%. But I also was coming off a TKO loss in the fight before that. And mm -hmm. I had had COVID like not even a month before and like literally had only got to train I asked them to extend the fight. I almost didn't get it. I just said, hey, could I fight like uh, a week later? Like I literally just started testing negative. I've been stuck at home. I haven't been able to train really. Let me get one more week of training before I leave and come out to Vegas for fight week. And uh, at first they said no. And then that's how the Hamzat one came up. Because I, I think they were going to try and reschedule Ed Herman. And they ended up doing it with somebody else. So, you know, that... I don't know if it made a difference because of my my how it affected me was very well. It felt very mild, but on the same hand, 
you know, probably should have took more time off after getting the flash knocked down from Heinish and uh, or getting TKO by him. And then, like I said, I literally had COVID and was testing positive for like two or three weeks and was only two or three weeks negative, like when I stepped in the cage to fight him. So yeah. if that dude wants to like, you know, make excuses about stuff or people want to like rub it in my face, like, oh, it's only 17 seconds. Like that guy couldn't even like barely train while he, you know, even like right after he had it, I literally fought him fresh off that stuff. You know, so that could took about a year off. Yeah, he took like a, almost a whole year off, I think, after he got yeah. COVID. Yeah. 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 And you, 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 you know, at that level, too, you need to be operating at 100%. You know, you can't be at 95% on the physical side, on the mental side. But at this, you know, you're, you're right. That's people need to know that, you know. So, how do you feel? Would you like, is it a dream rematch for you? Is it something you think about? Like, you know, getting another shot at a guy who's so, like on their radar now? So I've said this a bunch of times in a bunch of different interviews. I I would definitely welcome a rematch. However, I'm a very realistic person. We're on two different career paths right now. It seems that he's trying to stay at 170, right? And I, I'm doing just fine where I'm at at 185. And he's probably going to get a ranked opponent next, you know, most likely at 170. I still haven't fought a ranked opponent. I've got a bunch of fights in the UFC, and it's not like the first fight was close. You know, all extenuating circumstances aside, I said yes. So, you know, I feel like that information makes a difference, but it's still no excuse for, you know, getting starts like that so quickly. So I don't deserve a rematch yet, but at the point that I do deserve one, I would happily welcome it, um, you know, given that, it's a real yeah, possibility. Yeah, you hope you put yourself in a position again. Now, yeah, you're obviously like we've taken you through a large portion of the beginning of your career. You obviously you're you're kind of a critical thinker. You know, you're you're somebody that has got long term goals and understandings of how to get there. When you lose to Heinich and you lose to uh, you know Hazmat, you're do you see like were you concerned about getting cut after that fight? Uh, yeah. I mean, anytime you lose two in a row and it wasn't, you know, uh, the time before that I had like been on the wrong end of a couple split decisions, but it's like any, you know what I mean? Any loss in the UFC, any bad performance, they don't really have, there's not a set template of why you get cut. Right. So, and I, you know, I know I'm not like a super popular person, like, a you know, uh, McGregor or something like that as far as that goes but like people know who i am but you know i'm not like a, a pay-per-view guy yet so you know and i've seen them cut guys that had winning records um but yeah so that definitely factors into that and that just you know i took the appropriate amount of time after the hamzat fight and i was like you know if this is if i'm gonna keep staying in here and doing this and do the stuff i want to do i gotta make sure i take the time to prepare myself and be a hundred percent you know firing on all cylinders mentally physically uh, and everything else, and uh, luckily worked out. Yeah, I mean, you're for those, in a three-fight win streak right now. Yeah, exactly. For those not keeping track at home, you know, he went three and zero in 2021. You know, so yeah, Gerald, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you, man, like it wasn't easy watching that. Just like as a fight fan, just go, man, it's kind of disrespectful. They got another fight lined up, and you didn't allow them to cut you based on your performance this year. Like any doubts that anybody may have had were certainly erased on your last three performances, like incredibly impressive performances at that. Yeah, no, the, I definitely needed that first one. Uh, and the second one, I think against Murdoch really kind of put it over top, right? Cause that was, I think on some, some uh, sites, I was a seven to one underdog. And you know, he was, was he had, Floyd Mayweather guy? Yeah, he was backed by Floyd Mayweather, hadn't lost since, like, 2014 or 16. He had, like, an 11-fight win streak or something like that. You know, he's he was the next big thing they were pushing. He already had two TKO victories in the UFC, I think, two or three. And, uh, you know, he had TKO, um, I think, uh, Andrew Sanchez, the fight before. So he was coming in hot on that one, so I really needed that fight. Yeah, yeah. he has that poster boy look, like – 
Like, do you feel that in the UFC that when when the, that you get a guy like that, like they're pushing and stuff like that? No, yeah, no, I I understand. Like, it's you know, I don't get upset about it because like, no, I get it. He hasn't lost in a long time. He fights the way you want him to fight. Uh, and he's a foreign guy. They love that too. If you're a foreigner, you speak a different language. Um, you know that that helps a lot. You know because foreign fans really really back their guys. In the U.S., it's a little unfortunate, but, like, you don't really back our guys unless they're really, really famous, A, uh, or B, you'll get, like, the idiots do the USA chance at the fights, you know, if an American's fighting, like, somebody else. But that's, like, you know, that doesn't make dollars and cents. If you got a guy, especially from a smaller country, they're going to back him with their dollars, the people that have it, to watch that guy fight. So that's, you know, something you look for as a business. Yeah, no, no, I got a ton of respect for you. All right, a couple more. I got a couple questions for you in regards to the local scene. Um, let's see where they are. At. God, that's a wheeler. Oh, you never fought Andrew Trace on the local scene. Nope. Do you remember him? I do. I I thought our paths were going to cross <laughs> at some point. It just kind of never happened. So Andrew Trace, for those at home, you probably never heard of the guy. He's nine and two as a pro. He hasn't fought in years. He's got a rough dog MMA and he's got a win over Neil Magny. Like he is legit. And he decided to move out of state to become a fireman. And I I think he had all of the physical attributes to make it to the UFC. And he's even got the background. He hasn't, you know, just never, never did it. Yeah, no, I I don't know what happened. What, uh, you know, what, what exactly happened there? But yeah, I just figured we would fight at some point and just, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that was, uh, he was still at 170 and I had moved up to 85 and like he just wasn't going to come up. And like after the tournament, I sure as heck, I think I fought one time at like one or two times at 170, but he might have been already done at that point. But yeah, it just never, never came to fruition. Never panned out. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, your first international bout was against uh, Ser- Sergei Juskovic in Canada for the score fighting series. Was that difficult taking an airplane? That was, is that your first airplane ride to a flight to a fight? So that I didn't even get to go on an airplane. We drove. No, I was on that, I was on that car with Rick Glenn and Rick Glenn had told the P the, the show that we could drive and that, he didn't realize he was speaking on behalf of other people. So they, they took that as, Oh, all the guys are going to drive up. Cause Rick was like, Oh, I'll just drive. Cause Rick, Rick's awesome. Rick's also nuts. He was like, Oh, we'll just drive up there. But he was speaking for himself. And the show took that as like, Oh, all the Rufus sport guys would drive up. So we all ended up having to drive. And that was, uh, that sucked. That was the last time I actually made 170, like actual 170. And that was, uh, that was a long drive. How, how, how far was that? Oh, 14 hours or something like that. 12 hours, 14 hours. Yeah, we had to go down around Michigan and back up Michigan. Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty awful. <laughs> so you fight uh, Sergey, who's out of Head Rush Gym out of Lithuania. I think he was living in Canada for a little while. and went by the name The Leg Collector. Man, that Head Rush Academy or the Head Rush Gym, they have got some just absolute studs coming out of there that most people from this continent never even heard of. And you, they yeah. lined you up with one. And um, would you mind us taking us through the fight? Yeah. So uh, I forget if I shot on him or he shot on me, but like we were on the feet a little bit, just wasn't, you know, feeling great that night and, you know, didn't have a lot of pop. And I was just kind of maybe a little too tentative, but he ended up taking me down. I think he took me down. I can't remember exactly how we got into that position because I know we scrambled a little bit on the floor and he ended up going for uh, a knee bar is what he ended up getting me with. And it was just, you know, uh, I, I didn't see that his nickname was a leg collector or maybe it wasn't up there at that point and they didn't have like a ton of film. So all the film I had seen on him, he was grappling, you know, more upper body stuff and they dropped for like the knee bar kind of caught me by surprise, but I just, you know, that was there's a reason why that was the last time I cut to 170. I was like, that was too much. That guy was that was that guy was fresh and I was not at all. So 
from that fight, you take a few months off, and then you go up against Anthony Lapsley, future UFC veteran, who was 22 and five at the time. And you know, between the two of you guys, you guys have 37 total victories with only 11 defeats. Man, where are you at mentally? Talk about Lapsley, and then I, I need to know where you're at mentally after that because you refuse to quit. Yeah, no, that was uh, that one. He, I just kind of like sat there. He, that guy took me down. He got the rear. I think he was a rear naked that he got on me. But I just remember like yeah. I just didn't want to fight that day, and I was like, man, something, something's really messed up. Because uh, oh, and that was another one too. It was going to be at seventy. And then we agreed to like a catch weight or something like that. And that was another, uh, that was another, you know, thing that kind of led me towards going, staying at the middleweight, but that was, uh, yeah, mentally I wasn't in a good place. Uh, I wasn't focused on the right stuff. Um, yeah. And I just remember like, I was like, man, I don't want to be in here and that's not like me. Usually I want to fight and I just didn't feel like fighting that night. And that was like, you know, after that, I was like, I got to reassess some stuff and like kind of, get my head right because this is not not the answer at all and it didn't you know even if i had some wins after that it didn't happen right away but eventually i kind of got my groove uh, a little while after that what do you do mentally in order to change that because there was an absolute I mean, you lost two in a row and then you go on just this a terror we're not gonna get into it today but you go on a terror where like something changed uh, I got just got more comfortable, got more comfortable. I was a because at that point I had just got to Rufus Fort and I wasn't there super long, but I had to get comfortable with the system, uh, comfortable with, in, in the training environment. And another thing too is like I am very aware that like you know you can't possibly know everything or do everything, but I was starting to learn that I knew a lot less than I thought I did about striking specifically, and that like I didn't even know. Not only did I not know how to play the game, I didn't know the rules to the game itself to begin with. So that kind of messed with me a little bit. And it just took a while to like get past that hump. It, Cause it's like, even before it was like, okay, I had a, like a very base level, basic understanding of mostly offense and defense, you know, wasn't entirely there. And like all these subtleties of like why you move certain ways. Uh, and once I found that out, I was like, Oh man, like there's people, you know, now you're thinking that everybody knows this stuff and you're just the only one that didn't. So instead of just going out there and fighting and figuring it out, I'm like thinking about all the shit that I don't know that I know I don't know. So uh, that was probably the biggest thing that helps to getting over that hump. Man, yeah. Miguel. I was going to say Nick Thompson kind of describes a, a similar career path and a similar moment too. Like Strasser makes you tough. But then he showed up at Greg Nelson's and he was like, oh, there's, you know, there's a lot of other shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you, you paid your dues, but now you're at a, you know, surrounded by pros at, at Rufus Sports. So it, you, you felt that difference, got comfortable and went 11 and one afterwards without getting into the details. But that's, you know, a nice, unbelievable run. It, it, right. Gerald, I, I'll tell you, and uh, we're wrapping up, obviously, but like, there's many chapters in people's careers and like you can kind of see them level either they hit a certain point and they go away or they push past and we, we've seen two different ones just on this beginning portion of your career like in the beginning you don't really know much okay you kind of figure it out you got confidence well now you run into the guys that know more than you and you're like wait a minute I thought I kind of knew everything and then you make it go on a crazy run, hit the UFC. And as we have addressed earlier, right now you're on a three fight win streak. And it's like, you've almost turned another corner. It's like you found another gear. Yeah. I'm it's, hoping I did. <laughs> I mean, the UFC forces you to do that. If you don't, you know, yeah, you you're sink. not going to be there for, you've already been there five years. Now you've, now I think you finally got, you know, like, the experience is necessary to make a run. I, I don't believe is it mental? So few fights, you know. Uh, for me, yeah, that's the biggest thing for sure. I mean, you know, uh, I'm not like weak or really slow, but I'm also not like uh, an apex athlete or have like the best physical gifts. You know, I'm, I'm a little above average, but uh, for me, it's always been the mental thing. And if I can, you know, I'm comfortable competing in the UFC now, and I think that's a big difference. And I think, you know, uh, I'm comfortable with competing at guys of a certain level and like, you know, 
I can kind of understand what's going on and not just keep myself safe, but do damage and like comfortable and that I know how to do that. Even if I don't have like feel the best, like my last fight, you know, I just, uh, some things happened in my schedule where I just wasn't recovering properly. And obviously it changes too when you get older, but, uh, you know, I felt like I felt terrible the whole fight. Like, you know, usually you feel like you get nerves and stuff in the back, your legs and arms feel heavy, but then once the bell rings, you start fighting and it's like, Oh yeah, I'm fighting. This is all good. Well, as soon as we started, I was like, Oh, damn, I still feel really tired. <laughs> like this is not the, this is not good at all. But I thought, you know, I found out another thing or reaffirmed a thing about myself where like, even, you know, even if I don't feel the best, I can still gut out a win and figure out, you know, a way to finish a fight. That's, that's a really important thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and I'll tell you like uh, Hank and Nick Aguilar, I don't think they get enough credit for their contributions to Wisconsin mixed martial arts. Um like, I, I really admire both of those two and what they've accomplished. And, you know, the shame of it is, is they don't get enough the, the credit that they deserve. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, no, for sure. All right. Gerald, I think we're coming up on almost two hours now. And uh, sincerely appreciate your time and kind of walking through memory lane, um, especially that Wisconsin scene. No, I appreciate it, guys. It was great talking to you. Yeah. yeah well, absolutely. We got to get him again, Miguel, to finish up his career. That's what I was going to say. That's what I was yes. going to say. It's, a, it's actually a rare tree for us because we're like a history podcast. And, you know, we deal with a lot of old school guys that are retired and stuff. And it is a real treat to have a guy who's still active. And you could you, you could tell the difference Throwback. in the mindset, man. I mean, yeah, he's, yeah. He, this guy's still, you know, he's still actively playing this game. And it's, a lot of it is mindset, including – doing interviews and things like that. So definitely I very much appreciate your time. And it's a little different aspect for our fans out there too. You know, I like, I like, we've interviewed Heinich. I saw that you had a fight with Anders too. So yeah, we've we hit, got the, middle weight division, we've hit <laughs> the middle weight division pretty good. And uh, you know, I thank you for that. Cause, cause it, it, it adds to the podcast. It's no longer just history. It's active. It's active stuff too. So thank my you hats off to you. And I root for you, man. You, you, come, you come from my guys, too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate it, fellas. This is great. Awesome. Cool, cool. Take care, bro. Hey, we're going to probably air this in January. I'll send you all the information uh, prior to airing. All right? And, and absolutely, we'll try man. We'll up yeah. here on schedule. We'll figure out, like, when's a good time for you again during the day or whatever, and we'll get it done. So we got part two done, too. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks, I look forward to it. Cool. Thank you very much. Well, another one in the books, Joe Mirsha. Mike, I said we – I had ties to him, but man, this guy is from this guy is from my boys, man. This, that's right, that's right. I, I really enjoyed that because just that Strasser group and at that time frame when they were together, even at Nick Aguilar and stuff like that, those guys fought for me a bunch. So I definitely hit it off with this guy, even though I never met him, or maybe I did meet him at some you did point. Meet him. But I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember meeting him <laughs> when Joe first started he was real nervous and kind of a wallflower. He was a music guy. He was a music major in college. And uh, he, he was, he was somebody that was introduced to you and he'd like, be like, Oh, Hey, nice to meet you. You know, he just started. But on top of that, Miguel, let's, I mean, it, it also was kind of very personal to me because that, that group of guys in that show is the reason that you and I formed a relationship. Okay. That's where you, I mean, I mean, I met you at a couple of hook and shoots, but, you know, we didn't really get to know each other until, uh, you know, you were showing up over at Strasser's with myself. And that's kind of where our first kind of connection took place. Okay. But uh, Mearshart, all right. I made a mistake on some of my notes. I'm not, not me. Well, I guess inevitably, yes, myself. It's okay, Mike. The, our audience is getting used to it. Yeah, I know. I know. They're <laughs> point this out. So I'd rather, I'd rather like, you know, dude, I've, I've been reading the comments and, and they're dead on. They're a hundred percent dead on. Kate so, Collins has got you on in his sights, and you got yes, some people fucking with me like Carlos Diaz and stuff. But Kate Swallows has got yeah, you figured got out, bro. And that R D R D guy too. So, in essence, what takes place is uh, Jamil Masu fights Clay French at a really big local show that was like on ESPN Plus or something like that, and Garrity gets into an argument with Mearshart and slaps him, but it wasn't like, it wasn't, I, I remember it being much more than it was. And it wasn't, it was kind of a light slap. It was pretty funny. 
the deep pantsing of the referee took place at Shamil Masu in the WEC, which was the fight that we had referenced. Literally, he raises the other guy's hand and Dave Strasser pulls the pants down to the referee on TV. <laughs> so it's just, then it's just kind of like, yeah, I mean, it's like you talk to people about stuff like that, they're like, yeah, that sounds like something Dave would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. not a surprise, but, you know, does that shock you? Yeah. No, no, no. Look, I mean, I Dave is is maybe one of the guys I grew closest to throughout all this. Uh, you know, run into fight game because I really, I really enjoyed the guy because of that. Like there was a time here in Costa Rica at the mall that we're on an escalator and it's a glass escalator in a nice mall. You know, where like the the stores are around it. And he decides to fake a panic attack on the uh, on the escalator, and he lies down on it and starts screaming at the top of his lungs, "Get me off of here! Get me off of here! I'm gonna flip out! I'm gonna fall!" And he's screaming, and security starts to come, and he gets to the top, and he's like, "Okay, thanks, guys," and he walks off, leaves me there to explain. <laughs> yeah, that's so, <laughs> that's that's Strasser. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And that's the problem. The problem is, is that that Strasser didn't translate well you know it's like they didn't know that and, and he, he would always walk away and, and leave you holding the bag because you were shocked and you would stay there and he would just keep going no and i like, had somebody had to talk to security in spanish you know <laughs> so at any rate that's not so yeah so dave's uh is a character but yeah the, the pulling of the pants on tv that, is that a new high for him or a new low for him? What is that? I don't know. I don't know where it is. It's definitely something. Um, either way, Giro Mirshan, fantastic interview. Miguel, when we go back to Wisconsin, I think there's two people at the top of my list, Pat Berry and Adrian Serrano. I uh, have a feeling one of those two individuals is going to be coming up soon. And then we got to start kind of heading back to California. We got to start grabbing some of those cats again. You know, not, not, uh, you should probably put Nick Aguilar on the list, too. At some yeah. point, you know, his story is is going to be one of, uh, you know, getting really close to the big show and then kind of, you know, going a different way. And I think he had to do it with spreading out to start his own gym and this, that, and the other stuff. And I, re I really wonder what happened there. And uh, well, maybe he won't want to talk about it. But if he does... Right will be there and i love nick aguilar in terms of like i probably made 10 of his fights in, in the early part of his career so we're going to treat him good on here if he wants to come on so yep. thank you gerald mearshart yeah thank you gerald if you guys gamble bet to your side that eu 50 additional deposit up to a thousand dollars by using the promo code lights out abu dhabi jiu-jitsu pro is going to be in orlando in april end of april Please sign up on Smooth Cap. I'll be hosting that event. And Miguel, that is another successful interview. And I thought we I thought we did a pretty good job on that one. Yep, for sure. Definitely had fun. And thanks to Gerald. He he, you know, we do a good job when they do a good job. And and he was forthcoming and very honest. So he was great. Definitely an interesting yeah. cat, man. Definitely an interesting cat. He's the first guy who not only never, you know, no street fights or anything like that, but you know. I don't know. You know, he really wasn't a fighter when he, you know, until he became a fighter. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Him and Sam Alvey. Yeah. Excellent. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.